go ahead and stand up and let's read from Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. The prophet Joel says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel. Because they have scattered them among the nations. And have divided up my land. And have cast lots for my people. And have traded a boy for a prostitute. And have sold a girl for wine. And have drunk it. Let's pray. Lord God, as we look at this topic of salvation and judgment Lord, would you humble our hearts today? Would you open our eyes? Would you um, make us aware of, of blind spots, especially sin that we may not see for ourselves? Lord, would we invite your Holy Spirit to come and speak to us. Um, God, may we have a greater appreciation and understanding of your salvation and how great it is. For it's in your good name that we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. Is there a creator? And if there is a creator, is that creator, is that person that we call God, is he just? And if he is just, then what does he demand from our lives? And what will he do if we don't meet those demands in our lives. It basically comes down to the question, whom will God save? Whom will God save? These questions were asked in a book called Message of the Old Testament, um, by, written by a guy named Mark Dever who basically, he, and I'm, use, I'm just unashamedly using this book, it's really, really helpful for just understanding the whole concept of an entire book. It's, a, it's one thing to pe- preach one passage of Scripture, it's another thing to kind of preach an entire book. But that's what we're doing for the next few weeks, next ten weeks actually, as we go through the Minor Prophets. And the Minor Prophets set us up for the advent of Christ. They're the books, they're the last books in the Old Testament before you get to Matthew. And how does Matthew start out? It starts out with promises being fulfilled and God speaking to his people again and God promising that he's going to send a deliverer, that he's going to send a Messiah. But the minor prophets take place these hundreds of years before that advent of Christ happens. And we see God and his heart for his people as they are many times judged for their sin. So the prophet Joel helps us answer these questions that Mark Dever poses. And he goes on to ask other questions that I think are really, really good. In the end, we're going to see that God saves his people when, he, when they turn to him. God will not save the unrepentant, but God saves his people when they turn to him. But first, we need to ask and answer a few other questions, which will be basically the outline of the sermon. First of all, saved from what? Saved from what? Number two, what does salvation mean? And then finally, why will God's people be saved or maybe another question why will some be people be saved and others will not so let's go ahead and dive into this saved from what what are we being saved from what is it that we need to be saved from well judging from our text in Joel chapter 3, which is the third chapter, the final chapter in the book. And we're, don't worry, we're going to get back to the first two chapters. We're going to start with this third chapter. 
It's saved from God's judgment. Look at the text itself. I will gather the nations. I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And there I will enter into judgment with them. What he is talking about is entering into judgment upon the nations who have mistreated his people. They are, they have, they are enemies of his people. And as such, they are enemies of God. They've scattered them. They've led them into captivity. They have exploited them. They have engaged in trafficking their children. And God says, I will not abide by this. I will judge those nations. So God's judgment on sinners. So God does judge the nations. He goes on in chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. And Joel writes, speaking through the prophet, through, like God speaking through the prophet Joel. He says, proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. Hasten and come, all you surrounding nations. Gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. It sounds like a challenge. It sounds like a contest. It's almost the, it's the exact opposite of what Isaiah says. Beat your swords into plowshares. But no, this says, no, beat your plowshares into swords. It sounds like a challenge. It sounds like God is, is entering into a contest with these people. But in reality, if you go on and read verses 12 through 16, it's really just a summons into judgment it's not going to be a contest at all who can fight against the lord our god listen to verses 12 through 16 let the nations stir themselves up and come into the valley of jehoshaphat by the way jehoshaphat means judgment it's valley of judgment it's not valley of contest it's valley of judgment where the decision has already been made valley of verdict if you will for there I will sit to judge the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Did you see the switch in the language there? Earlier he's talking about war. He's talking about plowshares and swords and contest and all, the, all those things. And now, now once they realize what it actually is, it switches from a war metaphor to an agricultural metaphor. Put in the sickle. As if, God is going to sweep through with his judgment and people are going to fall just like blades of grass or stems of wheat. That's how lopsided the decision will be. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread the wine for the winepress is full. The vats overflow for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. That verse gets preached a lot, like multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, like asking people to make a decision. And that's not what this verse means at all. It means that God has already made his decision and judgment is coming. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people and a stronghold to the people of Israel. So then that begs the question, whom will God say? This sounds like God is against everybody else except his people. Well, everybody else is against God except his people. And even that's not guaranteed sometimes. Sometimes his people are even against him. Which is why we started in chapter 3. Because the first two chapters are all about God's judgment on his people. There's this principle in the scripture that says judgment begins with the household of God. That before God will go and judge everybody else and all the other nations, he will bring judgment upon his people. I saw this evidenced in, in class early on in my, in my school days. I had a teacher by the name of Miss Ferguson. She had a son by the name of Sean. Sean was smart. He, he got algebra better than anybody did, but probably because his mom was the algebra teacher. But, in early on, like, but I noticed something just sitting back and observing. Sean couldn't get away with the things that the rest of the class could. Why? Because Sean was hers. 
And you as Christians don't get along, don't get, you can't get away with the things that other people get away with. Why? Because you are his. And his eye is on you and he cares about you and he will bring the full force of his glory and his might and his majesty to make you and shape you and bring you into the image that he has designed for you and for me. So God's judgment, that's what we're saved from. And both the nations need it and God's own people need it. Chapter 1, if we go back a couple of chapters, begins with this warning, this imminent threat that's going on. It's, not, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's saying this is from the Lord. Listen to what it says in Joel chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Joel, came, came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Verse 2, hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of our fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation, like multiple generations there. And then he says this, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. And we don't know if that's talking about like different species of locusts or if those are just like different s- stages of the pupil and larvae and all those stages of a, a locust life cycle. But what he does mean is regardless of what that means, they are absolutely devastating the crops of Israel. They're wiping everything out. Listen to it as it goes on. Awake, you drunkards. Weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, a powerful beyond number. Its teeth are lion's teeth. It has the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste to my vine and splintered my fig tree. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. You get that? From the drunkard to the priest. The preacher to the drunk. They're all affected by this. Crops have been devastated. There's no more wine to flow. There's, no, there's nothing to eat. The, the, what are you going to do with the animals? It is a devastating swarm, and it's all foreshadowing something worse. He goes on in verse 10. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed, O tillers of the soil. Wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. Chapter 1 begins with present trouble, which is a locust invasion. But even in chapter 1, it starts this language, this foreshadowing of something much worse that is coming. Not just an army of insects, but an army of people, of warriors, which he gets to in chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Do you hear it? It almost starts with the same type of a thing. Hear this. This, this, this herald to stop and pay attention. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming near. Oh, okay, here now we get to something else. Before it was locusts. Now it's the day of the Lord. And what is the day of the Lord? When he enters into judgment with people. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming and is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful people like their like has never been seen before. Nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them and behind them is a desolate wilderness and nothing escapes them their appearance is like the appearance of horses like horses war horses they run with rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of mountains the crackling of the flame of fire devouring the stubble like powerful army drawn up for battle before them all 
peoples are in anguish and all faces grow pale. Like warriors they charge, like warriors they scale the wall, they march each his own way, they do not swerve from their paths, they do not jostle one another, each marches in his path and they burst through the weapons and are not halted. We're talking about an enemy that is ruthlessly efficient. That is ordered and is organized and is passionate and is moving. And God has raised up this nation to bring judgment upon his own people. Why would God judge his own people in such a way? Because of his people's sin. Because Israel and Judah would not turn from their sin. That's called unrepentance. And so God brings in his sovereignty and in his control and in his providence. Because he sets and appoints leaders how he wants. And he sets leaders and raises up armies. And he'll judge them eventually, but he will use them for his purposes. To bring judgment, to bring his people back to repentance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's all of us. You can look to your left, you can look to your right, you can look before you, and you can look behind you. And every person that you see is a sinner. All of us. The people sitting up here in the front rows, they're, the, they're just the ones who know it the most. They're not holier. Right? We're, you, we're sinners. And we fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin, Romans 6.23, tells us that is death. That that's what sin begets. That's what sin deserves. It's sobering. So that's, that's the thing. Saved from what? Who will God save? God will save people from his judgment. So what does salvation mean? Basically, it means three different things. Three, three, three aspects of this. It's not the only things that it means, but as we see in the book of Joel, we see that salvation, as he prophesies to his people, this is what salvation means for his people. Number one, it means God's rescue of his people from their enemies. Salvation means rescue. Jesus says, I've come to set the captives free. Paul says if anyone's in Christ, he's no longer that thing that he was. He, he's a new creation. The old things have gone, the new things have come. He's no longer a slave. Turn to, if we look in, in our, go further in, in the scripture here, chapter 2, verse 20. Verse 20 says, God promises in the midst of all of this, this is a section that starts, at least in my Bible, says the Lord has pity. Verse 20 says, I'll remove the northerner far from, from you, and I will drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. He's basically saying the invader that I've appointed to come in here and bring you back to me, guess what? I'm also going to remove him when you repent. I will rescue you. You will not be enslaved to them forever. I can raise up and I can tear down. I can invade and I can withdraw. It goes on in chapter 3. Look at chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth quake but the Lord is a refuge to his people a stronghold for the people of Israel so you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion my holy mountain and all Jerusalem shall be holy and strangers shall never again pass through it he promises this rescue and this deliverance but it's not just rescue it's also restoration he rescues his people from their enemies, but he also promises that he will restore his people's prosperity. He'll restore that. Everything that the locusts have devoured, he will restore it. Look at, go back. We're going to be doing a lot of page flipping. Go back to chapter 2, verses 18 through 27. Long passage. 
but let's go ahead and dive into it. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 18. The Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I'm sending, you, sending to you grain, wine, oil, and you'll be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach to the nations. I'll remove the northerner from you. I'll drive him into a parched land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for your pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be Full of grain, its vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dwelt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. He promises us all of those things. But it's not just rescue and restoration. The most important thing is that God resides with his people. You see, here's the thing. We live, in we live in an incredibly blessed country. We live in an incredibly blessed area. I don't know if you knew this or not, but 85308, I don't know if it's still true, but a few years ago when I first m moved here, Monty Patton, Joe Vermeer, who's running our sound today, who's making me audible to you, that's his daddy-in-law. He planted a church here like 20-something years ago, 25 years ago. And he told me when I first moved here, he goes, hey, bro, you need to know something about the people you're around I said what's that he goes it's one of the wealthiest zip codes in the entire phoenix metroplex i said hold on a second i said we don't live in snotsdale what are you talking about you know like what are you fountain hills i mean paradise valley like, like I, I know where some like you know down there around the biltmore I, i've seen some houses yo like i like mine's a mine's a stick house it's like you know cut it cookie cutter i can i can throw a rock and hit five more houses just like mine from where i am standing in my front yard we ain't no custom stuff around here. He goes, no, 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 you need to understand something, though. He goes, I'm not saying that we have more total wealth. I'm telling you that there are more millionaires in 85308 than there are any other zip code in the entire building. I'm not saying that they have the multi-millionaires like that, but we are more millionaires in this zip code than anywhere. What I'm saying to that is, like, we, we're rescued from our enemies. We're not worried about where the wine and the oil come from. We can go to Total Wine and buy as much wine as we want. We've done all that ourselves. You can have rescue and you can have restoration and not have God. The thing that makes heaven heaven is the presence of God. God resides with his people. Look at verses 28. Through 32 again. Well, I didn't get there. We, we'll, we'll go ahead and look there. But verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth and blood and fire and columns of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the lord comes and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the lord shall be saved for in mount zion the presence or in the mount zion in jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the lord has said and among the survivors shall be those whom the lord calls he calls us into his presence. He calls us into relationship with him. Look over at chapter 3, verse 16. Verse 16 says this, The Lord roars from Zion. He utters his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. 
What is a refuge and a stronghold? I re immediately re I'm reminded of the two towers, Helm's Deep, Lord of the Rings. They, float, they flee to Helm's Deep to withstand the armies of Mordor. Actually, it wasn't the armies of Mordor, it was the armies of Saruman, but that's getting a little bit nerding out on y'all. Amen. I love it. I love, man, we got so many babies. There was another baby born in our church just this last week. I mean, not, not here with us, but like, like, you know, another baby born this, this last week. We got another one back there, and we got another one on the way. It's just, man, we, I, I just love it. I love crying babies. That's a sign of a good church, crying babies. God residing with his people, God's presence with his people. John Piper asked a question like this. If you could have everything in the world that you wanted, all the food, all the entertainment, all the money, all the opportunity, if you could have that in heaven and Jesus not be there, would you want it? I'm afraid that a lot of us would be like, yeah. And that tells us where our heart of hearts really are. Because heaven just ain't heaven without Jesus. Because there are certain things that God's presence can give you that make you okay when you're still waiting on rescue and when you're still waiting to be restored. There are just things that you can have there that you can't put a price on. So God's presence, that's what salvation means. It means rescue. Rescue from our sin. Rescue from our enemies. Rescue from this world that is in corruption. We, yes, it absolutely means that. Restoration of all these things. Yes, we're going to have bodies that are not going to fail one day. There's going to be a whole lot of uninhabited real estate one day. We're going to get to travel, and we ain't going to have to pay a whole lot of money to do it. I don't even know if we're going to have it on planes. We might move by thought like Jesus did. He just popped in places. He didn't have to book no travel at all. He, it, it, he wasn't worried about any kind of freaking flyer miles. He just showed up. And also, this is kind of awesome, he just disappeared. It Won't that be awesome? Like, you don't like this conversation? Boop, gone. I don't know if we're going to have bodies like that, but I mean, that he's the first fruits of the resurrection. We're, it's going to be like that. It's going to be awesome. But it's not going to be heaven without Christ, without his presence. God's presence is what distinguishes his people from all other peoples. This is, it's God's presence. Moses, when he was getting ready to go in, and he says, how can we go without you? We can't go, we can't do this without you. Jesus, in John chapter 6, he's saying some hard things to people. And some of his disciples leave him. And Jesus, double, he, 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 go, he turns to his disciples. When, when everybody leaves him, he didn't just sit there and, and like say, oh, golly, okay, guys, I'm, I'm really glad you're with me. No, no, no. When all these disciples leave him, when he starts talking about flesh and blood and eating his body, and they get kind of freaked out, he turns to his disciples, the 12, and he says, you don't want to go with them too, do you? I mean, I, mean, I, I posted this a few, few days ago on Facebook. I'm going to go ahead and say it in public. If your Jesus hasn't invited you to unfollow him, your Jesus might be a figment of your imagination. Jesus is not dependent on you and your allegiance to him. He turns to his disciples and says, you don't want to follow also. And Peter says this great, great thing. He says, Lord, to whom shall we turn? It, it, we have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus, you would think, oh, it's like, oh, great. No, no, no. He doubles down on it. Jesus doubles down on it. He goes, he goes, did I not choose you the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Oh, that brings into some questions about election. Right? Jesus chose Judas. His daddy didn't. You see it? It's hard. We can wrestle with these things. It's what do you do till the end? He who perseveres till the end will be saved. Those who turn from their sin will be saved. Those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's why 
Now we come to our last one. Why will God's people be saved? And here's the answer. Because God will call them. Look at Joel 2.32 again. This verse, the first half of this verse is quoted in Romans. Romans 5.8. All who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's right here from Joel 2.32. And we preach this verse a lot. As this open invitation. And I'm going to preach it that way again. But I also want you to know that there's more theology behind it in the verse. Let's read it. Joel chapter 2 verse 32. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We love that. We praise God for that. But we ask, well, who are those? And we want to answer, well, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord. Well, how do they call on the name of the Lord? How should they call on him whom, whom they've never heard? How does that happen? How does a heart go from being in rebellion against God, being a sinner against God, being in enmity with God, not wanting to have anything to do with God? How does that heart get changed? Is it, is it dependent upon us? Do we got to convince them? Do we got to give them arguments? Do we got to make them, we got to reason with them? And, and I, listen, I've, I have parented now three teenagers. You can't reason with the heart. You can't. I'm so, I, we got a lot of young families here. A lot of young families. I cannot wait until your kids get to be teenagers. It's going to be awesome. And I'm going to be the gray old man sitting in the corner laughing. Like, and praying. Praying laughing. <laughs> laughing prayer. Like, you know, not that, not Toronto's type stuff, but anyway. Like, but, like, you, you can't reason with the heart. What has to happen is there has to be something act upon that heart. And God does that. Listen to the rest of the, of the verse. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape. He's saying, there's going to be some people that are going to make it out of this. And as the Lord said, and among the survivors shall be those who, whom the Lord calls. God. God initiates. God calls. And praise God he does. Because if he doesn't we are hopeless and hell bound. But God calls. 1 John 1.9 we love because, now that ain't the right verse, but it, it, it is the right one. That, that's a different one. And it's not in my notes, so forgive me. But there is a verse in 1 John It says, We love because he first loved us. If you're sitting out there today and you say, I love God, it is because God first loved you. You didn't just wake up one day and decide, you know what, I'm going to love God today. It don't work that way, homie. You've got to be acted upon. Your heart is dead. What can dead hearts do? Nada. It has to be reinvigorated. It has to be made new. It has to be made alive. And that's the kind of stuff that God does. He restores. He makes alive. And what are we supposed to do when that happens? God saves his people. Why will God's people be saved? Because he will call them. But also there's some other practical things for that. He saves his people to make himself known. He, wants, he wanted Israel to be a light to the nations and he wants us to be a light to the nations. He wants us to be salt and light. We're saved because God calls us, but we're also saved to make God known. And also we are saved because God calls us and we're also saved to display God's character. Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom. The church, this church, a lot of other churches, these are supposed to be little outposts where the kingdom and its values are expressed and lived out, where the character and the glory of God are on full display for anybody who wants to come and see. That's how it's supposed to work. That's... That's another reason why we're saved, why God saves his people. So God's people are saved to make him known, to display his character and his glory because he calls them. He's not left himself without a witness. 
So, whom will God save? Those who repent of their sin, who turn from it. You say, well, wait a minute, didn't you just say that God has to call you? Yeah. You ain't going to turn from your sin unless God calls you. You just won't. But when you do, that's proof that he called you. You see it? Those who repent of their sin, who turn away from it, who renounce it. Those who confess their sin to God, who fess up, who own it, renounce your pride, who admits it. Those who turn to God. Repentance is, is too, it, it's, it's a two-faceted two issue. You turn away from your sin to God. Don't just make it a 90-degree turn. No, make that sucker 180. Don't turn from your sin to another sin and go in another direction. No, turn from your sin and go toward God. Those are the people that God saves. So those who repent of their sin, confess their sin, turn to God, those are God's people. And that's what I'm inviting some of y'all to do. You've been coming here for a while. You've been thinking about this. You've been tap dancing around it. You've come to believe that God is real. And I'm asking you to just lower your pride and put your trust in God to turn from your sin and let him have lordship and ownership of your life. I'm asking you to do that today. And you, you, can, you can say it really, really simply. Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm owning it. Lord, I want to repent of my sin. Lord, I want you. Will you save me? And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the promise of Scripture. If you genuinely turn from your sin, you genuinely want God, that means God called you and he'll save you. So I want to invite you to do that. And if you do that today, I want you to come and tell the person that you came with or I want you to come and tell me. Okay? Just let us know. For some of you, you've been saved for a while, but you, for whatever reason, you've been hesitant. You haven't taken that next step towards baptism. I want to invite you to do that. I want to invite you to take that step. I invite you into a conversation. Go to the next baptism class. Come and talk to me if that's going to be too late. Like... We, we, can, we, we love having a wet stage. We love baptizing our friends. We baptized somebody last week. It was awesome. We got another young girl in our youth. She's going to get baptized for too long. We want you to profess publicly, and we will celebrate with you. We will walk beside you. If you are a Christian and you've never been baptized, get baptized. Get baptized. Proclaim it. He didn't die on the cross in some you know back alley in private. He died on the cross publicly for you. Get baptized publicly for him. For those of you that you've not been, you, you've already been saved, you've been baptized, we want to invite you to communion. Come and take this. Remember this. But I want to ask you to take it, don't take it lightly. Repent of any place in your life where you're not displaying the character of God. Repent of any place in your life where you're not depending upon his rescue and his restoration. Just repent of that. And know and remember with communion that he's for you. He's going to be with you. He's going to take, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. And then for all of us, once communion's done, we come down these center aisles, we take the elements, we go back our seats, we take communion. As we sit in our seats, Kyle's going to start leading us and we're going to stand. And I'm going to ask you to open your mouth and give God the glory due his name for his great mercy for his great justice for his great character and the fact that he took all of that judgment poured it out on his son Christ so that you and I could be saved that he faced that judgment for us we've got stuff to sing about let's pray let's take communion let's sing if you want to become a Christian man let me know let me pray for you Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace. God, would you speak now? Would you continue to speak? Lord, may, may you, I just want to shut up and let your Holy Spirit work. Would you do that? And may we sing to you the way that you deserve it. In your good, good name we pray. Amen.